Hello, for you regulars out there, welcome back after our September break in our Concordia Live series as we focused on the annual summit. I hope many of you were able to join us either in New York City or online for the summit. For any newcomers, welcome to Concordia Live. My name is Ashley Abair, Concordia's Programming Manager, and I'm so pleased to have you all here with us today. A special thank you to our global patron member, Vistagen, for organizing today's important discussion. Vistagen's mission is to radically change the trajectory of mental health care through their distinct therapeutic approaches. Statistics say nearly one in, Ameri one in five Americans are directly impacted and currently experiencing mental illness in 2022. In today's Concordia Live, we are honoring all who continue to work through and overcome mental health challenges, whether it be directly or indirectly. Today's panel will expand on the need for an innovative approach to mental health treatment and the importance of breaking down the many societal stigmas around mental health. A few housekeeping items before we get started. All attendees are automatically muted upon entry, but we do hope that you'll take advantage of the chat feature to introduce yourself, react to comments in the discussion, and engage throughout the conversation. To ask a question, please utilize this same chat function at the bottom of your screen. Our moderator will do her best to answer all questions at the end of the session. Lastly, this webinar will be recorded and available on Concordia's webpage and YouTube channel. Now, without further ado, I'm honored to introduce today's moderator, Dr. Zabina Bazin, often known as Dr. Z, who is the CEO and founder of NKIDS. NKIDS uses games, toys, and fun to, in, to teach serious topics like diversity, inclusion, belonging, and in today's case, mental health. To borrow a compelling line from her biography, yes, our country is in a crisis, but the good news, not only can we change it for our children, but we can also change it with our children. And Dr. Bazine is here to prove it. Dr. Bazine, over to you. Thank you so much, Ashley. First, I'd like to tell everyone, I apologize for my voice. I am recovering from bronchitis and laryngitis. So please bear with me. Um, I wanted, I'm very excited about today's conversation. It is very important to me and I know to all of the panelists as well. And I'm sure to all of the audience who is sitting and listening to this conversation today. So even before the COVID pandemic, mental health has always been a concern in America. Unfortunately, we saw large numbers of increase in the past three years, and the numbers have only increased as we speak today. Today's conversation is more than just a Q&A. It is a roundtable conversation, and I would like at any time for any of our panelists to jump in and talk about their concerns with each of the questions that we are talking about. So today, we are talking about a very important topic that is facing America right now and will go into the future unless we take the steps to create some sort of treatment, programming, and conversation about it. So let's get started. And I'd like to pose my first introductory question to each of the panelists. The question is, what inspires you to work in the mental health space? And I will start before I introduce everyone and why this is important to me, is as a child psychiatrist, someone who's worked within the mental health field for children under the age of 12, there is no other opportunity to start working with our kids and our youth as early as five years old to help them understand that creating a space that they can speak about their mental health issues is important. There has been a stigma within the adult society always, and we need to make sure that we don't create that for the future of our children and let them have space as well to talk about this. I'm going to start with our first panelist on the same question that I just said. Mr. Sean K. Singh, who is the Chief Executive Officer and Director of Vistagen. Mr. Singh has nearly had 30 years of experience working within the private and public biotechnology and medical device of pharmaceutical companies and a venture capital firm in profitable contract research. He is serving in numerous senior management roles. And prior to joining Vistagen, he served as the president of Armit's Neuroscience prior to the acquisition of the company. 
Mr. Singh, I would like to also pose the same question to you that I just answered, which is what inspires you to work in the mental health space? Dr. Z, great. It's always a pleasure and just a joy to talk to you. You have so much to add to the community. So I appreciate that. And we thank you for that. And it's also an honor to speak with the rest of the panelists. So this is indeed an important topic. Um, we all, I think, share the belief that mental health is foundational to living vibrant and healthy lives. And we all know that healthy uh, minds create healthy communities. But the problem is people are hurting. And in one way or another, we know directly or indirectly, um, mental health challenges have touched just about everybody. And so what inspires me and what inspires our entire team at Vistagen is, is really the unique opportunity to be a change maker, to help improve the lives of people who are, who are really handcuffed, in our case in particular, by anxiety and depression and suicidal ideation, the things that steal joy from them and prevent them from becoming really who they want to be. So that opportunity to help people live uh, happier and healthier lives by, in our case, developing and hopefully providing treatments with the potential to really flip the script from impossible to possible. And uh, it's a really powerful privilege and it's a very... Um, it's an inspiring day-to-day -day opportunity. So I, in sum, that's it. I, I love how you said flip the script. That's actually the most important part of this conversation is to really change that mindset of how we talk about mental health and how we further talk about it with everybody else. I'd like to next introduce Melissa, and I'm sorry, I don't want to screw up his last name, but Melissa is a mechanical engineer by trade and a graduate of Europe's most prestigious mathematical institution. He is a pioneer within the mental health space. He is the founder and CEO of Wevo, a global company focused on diagnosing, monitoring, mon monitoring, and helping the people as well as the mental health institutions. Melissa, please say your last name so I don't make a mess, and I would love for you to answer the same question that Sean just did. Okay, first of all, uh, good morning to everyone, and I'm really honored to, to have this panel today with you. So my last name is Aksintievich. This is the, the right uh, pronunciation. And uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, having me on this uh, discussion. And I have to say that I never thought that I will, I will be in this industry, mental health industry. But uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I'm in. Unfortunately, I'm in because I had my personal issues with panic attacks and anxiety, high level of anxiety. And fortunately, I'm here because I found a way how we can deal with the anxiety, with panic attacks, and how we can fight against it. So uh, actually, that things motivates me, you know, to to share how I solve my problem and to to work together with a, with a huge population in 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 a way to to solve these anxiety problems, panic attacks problems, and to be together with it. So actually, I ha I have the personal reason for why I'm in this field. Thank you. It is always important for that as well, because many of us have those personal reasons that come from this. And I, I, I really enjoy that you shared that, Melissa, and it's very important for us to understand that. The vulnerability in that answer was, was beautiful. Um, next, I would like to introduce someone who I admire very, very much, Kana Enomoto. Um, she is the Director of Brain and Health um, for the McKinsey Health Institute and co-leads the McKinsey Health Behavioral Health Domain where she integrates knowledge of mental health and substance use, policy and research, and perspectives. She also supports the National Partnership in, in the United States to strengthen community-based suicide prevention and crisis system, and is one of the leaders of SAM Hasha and is, is part of the Prevention and Treatment for Recovering Services. Kana, I would love for you to answer the same question that we just posed to both of the other panelists. Sure, and thank you, Dr. Z, for the work you're doing on behalf of children everywhere. Um, you, your story and your work is completely inspirational, and um, it's great to be here with, with this panel. At the McKinsey Health Institute, we were founded on the conviction that over the next decade, humanity could add as much as 45 billion extra years of higher quality of life. 
and fundamental to achieving that kind of gain, that'd be six years on average for everybody on the planet, um, we know that we have to address brain health, right? So there's a 10 to 25 year lower life expectancy for people with serious mental illnesses. You know, these are conditions of the young, they start, you know, three quarters of them start before the age of 24. Uh, and it's a leading cause of, of global burden of disease, right? So, so mental and substance use disorders drive about 10% of all global disease burden. And when you take into consideration the disease burden of the, of the associated risks of physical health conditions that we know, like cirrhosis and, and substance use disorder, then you're looking at 15%, driving 15% of global disease burden. Um, and yet we have not scaled what works. Right? We know that there are the treatments that Sean's done, that Melissa has done, that you have done, that people have not adopted. And they're not adopting them sort of for the wrong reasons. You know, if you had a rash of children showing up in the emergency room with broken legs, right? You wouldn't say, let's invent a new treatment for broken leg syndrome. You would say, why are all of these children showing up with broken legs and let's do something about that. And so we have done a, a pretty cool uh, some modeling in terms of if we went around the world and we actually scaled what works, we actually did the prevention that we know we should do, that we actually did the social emotional supports that we know that people need. We actually had scale for the both the, the psychosocial and the uh, pharmacological treatments that people need. How much of that burden could we actually address or prevent? And it's half, right? Like 333 million life years coming for disability adjusted life years coming from uh, mental illnesses and substance use disorders, we could tackle 150 million of those if we actually did uh, what we know that we could. And that is just what gets me out of bed every single day. I totally agree with you. Um, and I feel your pain about getting out of bed and, and, and just dealing with this. So I, I totally agree with you. Um, I'm going to start with a quick question, kind of back to you as well, to move along with this conversation. So we have in American history, a suicide national hotline that was a full number that I don't think many people knew about. That was, a, I think, a 1-800 number that people could call. Recently, July 16th of this year, um, we launched a 988 number very similar to 911 that people could call for suicide prevention and also to talk about mental health issues. I think we need to talk about that a little bit more because I don't think many people know about that. Can you speak on 988, the suicide crisis pipeline, and what is the purpose of it? And what does it mean for the nation? Right. Yes, um, that is great. So yes, we had 1-800-273-8255 since 2005. Um, and <laughs> you wonder why weren't people calling it? Um, uh, but, but people were calling it. In fact, you know, 2 million people a year have been calling that number for, you know, close to 20 years. Um, but in October 2020, Congress passed and the president signed the National Suicide Hotline Designation Act and made 988 an official nationwide three-digit number that anyone from anywhere could call if they're experiencing a behavioral health crisis. And so it doesn't have to be suicide. It could be uh, if you're experiencing a mental health crisis, if you're experiencing a substance use crisis, um, and, and you only have to remember three digits. And, and it has that, like you, I, I think you were, mentioned it earlier, um, it, it's like 911, right? So it conveys to people that this is a, a serious issue for which you um, might need, and certainly you do deserve um, for a response. Uh, and so it's changing uh, in two things. One is that previously people were often calling 911. People still do call 911 for a mental health or substance use emergency. And then you would often get a law enforcement response rather than a health response. And what we'd love to see is that for many people who um, don't, who aren't uh, in imminent danger to themselves or someone else, that they would get a public health response because that will help them uh, get to the, the sort of um, supportive services that, that are more likely to help them. Um, and then at the same time, what the government has done is they've created a, a vision so that within the next year and a half, all of those calls to 988 will be answered by a crisis line in your state. So someone who is familiar with the services uh, and resources that are near you. By 2025, the objective is that 80% of Americans will live in a place where they can, if you need it, 
someone can come to you with a mobile crisis response. And then by 2027, the hope is that 80% of Americans will live where in a place where there is somewhere safe to go, where you could go to a crisis respite, a crisis stabilization unit, a crisis receiving facility, um, not just go to the emergency department. Um, and what we've seen just in the few months since 988 uh, went live in July, that there has been a 45% increase uh, year on year from, from August 2022 to, to August 2021, which means that Lifeline counselors answered 23,000 more calls uh, um, just than, the, than they'd had the week before. And it's calls, texts, and chats. Uh, and I think there's just a lot of promise to transform the way we're responding to people who are in the greatest need. That's fantastic. I mean, to just hear the numbers that you're saying right now makes me feel so important. It's so special to hear that we actually have a place now people can go outside of 911 because I know when there were crises, the ERs were filled and they didn't know how to treat these patients. And to see that you're going to have this change within 2025 and 2027, it actually gives an inspiration that everybody has an ability to deal with their mental health issues. So I applaud that. And I think it's going to be fantastic for everybody across the country. Um, with Z, can I add yeah. something on that while we're on this topic? Absolutely. <laughs> You know, this comes up a lot. I travel all around and I'm often hearing from just people who are not in our industry, just people that are worried about this. They see it in the media and they say, you know, what what really can I do um, at this time? And as we think about it, and we know that suicides uh, during the pandemic, especially among youth, have increased 57 percent just in the last three years. And incidents of mental illness have increased triple during the pandemic. But the, what I typically say is the easiest thing you can do is is just listen, and it's that's what this hotline often is is involves is people listening, right? So being ready to listen, and and actually listening that's one of the easiest ways to live beyond yourself in the midst of this crisis and actually think that you're going to have an impact. Whether you're coaching a team or you're in a you're having coffee with your friends, uh, you could be anywhere. You hear signals, and just take an extra moment and hear somebody out. It, it's amazing the impact that that does. And we know that impact is there with the 988 data that Connor just noted. Mm -hmm. We need a lot more money for the 988. Every single state and every single community needs more money, but it's a great start. I, I totally agree with you. And, and to say it as a therapist, you don't have to be a therapist to listen. You just have to have an open ear. And I think, Kana, one of the things that you mentioned is it's not just for a place for people who are dealing with mental health or a suicide issue. It's for someone to actually call in and say, I've just listened to someone and to understand how do we help that person as well. So it, it, Sean and Kana, what both of them you have just said is very important that you don't have to have the mental health issue. You can also be that person who actually sits and listens to someone and just helps them out in so many aspects and especially with our youth. And, and I'm a little biased to that, but our youth needs a lot more ears to listen to. And I think we as adults have to listen to them and not really try to give those advice. I think we need to have some of the professionals do that, but they really just need a listening ear. So I do agree with that. Mm -hmm. And actually this transitions really well, Sean, into my question with you. We've seen the ERs, you know, for years now that most Americans are aware of the much publicized opioid um, epidemic. But we've heard less and less about the benzoid epidemic. So I wanna talk a little bit about that because that's actually affected us in this period that we're talking about mental health. And tell us a little more about that and what Vistagen is pioneering to help address that as well. Yeah, the uh, long before even the pandemic, the, the FDA put out a drug safety communication on what are called benzodiazepines, right? Drugs that are often used, as you well know, for anxiety disorders. And when used properly, just like opioids, you know, they can actually be effective. But the FDA saw in the early innings of the pandemic um, that the prescriptions for benzodiazepines were just skyrocketing. There were 92 million prescriptions even before the pandemic. And the first chapter of the pandemic, uh, that rate increased by about 38 to 40 percent. So the problem with them is there's a very high risk of abuse and misuse and overuse. Uh, and so the risk of addiction underlies the potential benefit the drugs can deliver. So while they may uh, provide rapid 
fairly fast onset benefit in an anxiety, especially acute anxiety mode, uh, that effect lasts for a while, can, pair, can impair your cognitive functioning. Uh, and again, the risk of abuse and, and addiction is super high. So you have to sit there and worry about the longer term consequences of these medicines uh, while trying to deal with your acute issue. We're developing what we think needs to happen because while in many other sectors, we've seen advances in, uh, in drug therapies, uh, cancer and many other pain, other indications, just hasn't been much done that's different in the mental health arena for decades. Drugs are very similar. Um, unfortunately, they take a long time to work. They're, if you have depression and you want to go and start on an antidepressant currently, you have about a one in three chance of that working. And that's going to not tell you that for six to eight to 10 weeks. Same thing with, with anxiety drugs. So benzos, we need benzos really the effect, which is a rapid onset, but without the baggage of the side effects and the safety concerns. We're developing a drug called PH94B, which is designed to be to work acutely, but to be used uh, as needed. And what we've seen from some of the data so far is that the more often that it's used, the less people avoid in the social anxiety disorder context is our main focus. They avoid the stressors and the situations that uh, really impair and give them high opportunity costs in their life. So we need medicines that work faster. We also need medicines in the mental health arena that are safer. Uh, and so our mission is, and you can't, there's no one size fits all. We all know that from a medication standpoint, and every single medication has to augment your profession, right? It has to augment talk therapy. So, and complement it in a way that people gain confidence in their life that they can get through these stressors and not have them impair their functioning. So we're in phase three development uh, with PH94B and we hope to see a, uh, a case where we don't have to lean into benzos as a society uh, to deal with the anxiety disorders that really impair people's lives. And it's a big deal. I mean, the, the rates of anxiety in this country are skyrocketing the pandemic. It was already there before the pandemic, but the pandemic has magnified all of these issues, anxiety, depression disorders, as you well know. So um, it's time for fundamentally differentiated medications that can achieve the benefits that people need rapidly and without worrying that side effects and safety concerns are gonna override the issue they're trying to treat. You know, as someone who actually was diagnosed with an anxiety disorder much before I became a psychiatrist and has mental health in her family, where it's a stigma because of our culture, but I, I appreciate what you're doing because it is an epidemic and giving medications like that, especially to the youth, it, it causes more of a, you know, place where they become, you know, uncontrollably taking their medications and they don't understand, like you said, talk therapy and other treatment plans that could help. So I admire you bringing this kind of treatment plan into the, the world so we could actually deal with the issues rather than treat it with a drug. And, you know, being a psychiatrist, that's something we're taught is to diagnose and treat. But I love that these alternative pathways are being taken place. Um, anybody Every patient's journey is different. You know, you're, what you need at one point in your journey is different from what you need later in your journey. And so that's why... I applaud everybody in our field. I just, I hope everybody's successful because we need multiple opportunities and alternatives for people to fit whatever their unique patient journey is. And that needs care of professionals like you and social workers and really peer to peer counseling is critical in this whole process, especially among communities of color where the trust you know, and the stigma really have a disproportionate impact. Absolutely. Um, Melissa and Kana, any remarks to this? I would love to hear any feedback from what uh, Sean just talked about. Yes, I think definitely. I would like just to add uh, something before we, we mentioned about this, um, this call center, and I think this is the great idea. I think that that thing will help, help a lot, but I still think that, you know, um, uh, we, we are fighting with the resources and we're, with capacities in terms of the listeners. So when we are saying it, it, it's it's great to have someone to listen us, 
but we need to understand how much people we have on one side who can listen the others on the other side because the other side on the other side we have so many people who who needs to be listened so so but i think that that the, again this is the technology tool that giving people the access to to the to the to the care and giving them the access to the potential treatment so th this is great and when we are talking about the 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 vista gene uh, products i was the one who was using you know xanax uh, but for just short period of time for just 7 days and i totally understand you know uh, what is happening there and what is the 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 the, the straight effects but also what is the side effects and i i think that we definitely there is a huge space it's a, it's a big hole there in terms of uh, what sean just said you know how we can improve that products and when we are coming to the stigma i think you know that stigma is coming for, for uh, so I want to compare the thing, you know, with uh, probably the biggest stigma that was the biggest stigma, and it's still the stigma with the people who had or who have the AIDS. So stigma is something that people doesn't understand. And it's it's something that's, that, that is not tangible to people. And then people, you know, it, it's about the brain. We are talking about mental health. Mm -hmm. And everything connected with the brain is intangible, right? And then people are struggling with it to say about their problem because it's much easier to say that we have, let's say, heart problems. Because if we say we have arrhythmia, this is not so bad. But if we say we have the mental problems or panic attacks, it looks very weird and very strange. So I think that we can break that stigma by making more initiatives by talking a lot on every place about it, by having the people like myself who had the anxiety, who, who can open talks about their personal issues and giving courage to the other people, you know, to go out and talk about their problems. So I think it can be done. It can be done. No, you're absolutely correct. I, 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 I can't agree with you more. Um, Kana, I didn't know if you had a comment or not, but... I think just to, to both uh, Melissa and Sean's point, one thing that people can do is to um, educate themselves on what are the signs of someone who is in distress, right? So mental health first aid, psychological first aid, assist for suicide prevention. There's lots of things that we can all do because everyone knows, well, I don't know everyone, but I think most people know I'm feeling I have pain in my chest and a, and, and a sensation down my left arm. You're like, ah, you need to go see somebody for your heart. Um, but people don't always know the signs of, of other types of conditions of when is it a, when is it depression, when might it be depression, when might it be a substance use problem. And I think if to the degree that we can educate ourselves of what those things look like, it gives us the chance to both practice prevention, as well as to intervene early and to support the people that we know and love. You know, Kana, it actually, it's interesting you were saying that there, you know, the associations like the American Heart Association has this great commercial on stroke for women, especially to look for the signs. And I agree with you, Sean, if 988 had more resources and financial means, we could create more commercials that actually could teach other people what are the signs and symptoms to look out for people with mental health issues or with substance abuse. Because not only does the, the patient not see it themselves or the individual, it's to educate the person who's trying to help them as well. So Kana, I think... If we could get more resources for that, I think for the larger community, that would be a really great way for us to help this. Yeah, but I would say when we talk about more resources, um, we don't necessarily say um, we should have grants to help right. people treat heart disease, right? Uh, <laughs> right, like or or screening for diabetes should be right. covered by volunteers um, at a contact center. Um, so I think part the most fundamental is is treating this like a health condition, like other health conditions. Hundred percent, totally. The Surgeon General's done a lot on that regard, and so you really have to give a lot of credit, uh, a lot of credit to his team, especially at the national level, trying to emphasize physical and mental health parity. But you know, awareness is key because even um, I hear it all the time. There are parents who think their kids are trying to just get attention. 
right? There are, the, the ignorance is still out there. So the awareness is, is key. I mean, we weren't having these kinds of panels three years ago, as often as I've seen them just of late. And I, I think that's a very encouraging, I'm a glasses half full person, but the silver lining of the tragedy of the pandemic is that there is now a lot of reasons for people to feel uh, oh, it's it's okay to not be okay and to be more comfortable talking to their boss, to their family, uh, to their friends, to their teachers. It's just more normative now. And I think that's that's the first step because if you combine awareness of what the heck anxiety even is, what's depression? You know, what are the, some of the signs and signals? Where What do you need to look for? Now, as we were talking about earlier at the at the Goldie Hawn event, you have yeah. you have youth pointing out to their parents that, hey, mom, you you actually need to talk to somebody because of all the devastating impacts of the pandemic on social isolation, vocational challenges, life loss. I mean, all those things are they are really impacting people across every single demographic. And I'm I'm encouraged by the increased awareness, just even in the last six months. Um what I know and hear and see is that people are getting it. Like, mm -hmm. and you're right, the resourcing isn't there to match it. We could have, you know, 10,000 more of you, Dr. Z, and there's still going to be a long cycle time to get care. Yeah. That's why I think the peer to peer, it's so critical that somebody who, especially at the youth level, when a high school student who's wrestled with depression is yep. talking to another high school student who's wrestling with depression, it's a big deal. Right. And especially in communities of color where they're talking to someone who's been in their exact position that is their color, they can trust that person so much differently. So a lot of that work that the Surgeon General is advocating is it's just making an impact. It's it's really encouraging. It's a big problem, but there's still some, yeah. there's a lot of hope on the horizon, right? Well, I totally agree with you. I think we have to admire the fact that the Surgeon General brought this up and created his, you know, document, which was in the early years of when COVID occurred. And he created this youth to youth peer conversation. And when he did his launch here in Los Angeles, which I attended, it was amazing to listen to the youth and actually advocate for not only themselves, but say, this is what we need from you. And that right there was actually what we were listening to, which is the work I do, is how do we listen to these youth voices because they are going to be creating the future for themselves. And they are the ones who are going to actually create these programmings that we actually haven't been able to do. So I agree with you, Sean. We need to, I admire and also have to advocate for what he has done, um, the Surgeon General, and what he's still trying to do. So the I, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think we should all support him and do as much as we can to help him as well. I do want to move on to, um, as we talk about treatment plans, and we mentioned that medicines are not the one size fits all for treating mental health. I would like to ask a question to Melissa. Um, you're the forefront of an innovation for mental health care using AI. In what ways could such technology revolutionize the nation's response to mental health? This is a really good question. and. Um... I, I want to say that we are pioneers in the fundamental transformation of the mental health industry and the radical change in the way people are diagnosed, monitored, and guided to effective and personalized treatment. We see WeWo as a nucleus in connecting and integrating all elements of the mental health industry, starting with the government, national healthcare systems, hospitals, and patients. At first, we provide proper assessment that can be done from home. This is the huge improvement. On top of that, one key element is the WeWo's ability to send real-time reports. Reports sent within one minute to a person's mental health center and professional. So care decision can be taken with up-to-date and accurate information. WeWo will identify triggers and patterns of mental distress, helping doctors to provide more specific help. And finally, when we are talking about helping the government and national healthcare, healthcare system, we will enable better healthcare spending. We are generating rich data reports on the current mental health needs and trends locally, such as within the state. This will enable better and more confident decisions on healthcare spending. And we will show the impact of healthcare spending and other policy decisions on mental health reducing inefficiencies of the system. 
that is actually a, a great way to put it because I actually appreciate the fact that you have not only cr are creating a treatment plan that is alternate to a medical you know, drug, but it's also how does it impact within policy change as well. So I am actually very, very, uh, I applaud you for actually bringing that up to the forefront. Um, I want to go to a question for the whole, um, we've talked a little bit about this, and I think it's important for us to emphasize this part about how the pandemic, and I think Sean, you brought it up a little bit, Connie, you brought it up. I want to open this to the group is, how has the pandemic impacted America, specifically here within the United States, the mental health initiative? And I know we've talked about the Surgeon General, but I think each of you are doing something very different when it comes to the impact that the pandemic has had. I'd like to talk a little bit about that because I think the, the general population sees that it's been come to the forefront, but I think there's more than that impact that has come across. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that. And Sean, I'd like to start with you because we, we started with that conversation of the Surgeon General and he launched this, this initiative, but what is this large impact that we're seeing here in the United States? Well, I think we know, unfortunately, we know that the data will tell us that the longer we live with the pandemic, the more we're going to see the impact, right, and the deterioration of, of mental health. We, we know that's the challenge. So the fact that we know what it is that we have to deal with always helps with anxiety, right? If you know you have to muscle through something and you know there's an end to it, then it's a lot easier to deal with it. But I think just the, the fact that the the problem has been elevated to a national platform and that the message is being reiterated over and over and over by different uh, people focused on providing help is has been it, it's been uh, welcomed I think it's not enough but it has to continue I just also it's back to awareness um, there's definitely a greater sense of what these debilitating disorders are, how they can affect physical health, uh, how critical they are, really in an all of society approach, as the Surgeon General said. I love that it's getting into the workplace now, and that's often a safe harbor for a lot of people um, who are challenged in their home environment, especially in the work from home even environment. So that we're getting back to in-person um, interactions, notwithstanding this, virtual platform. I think that's making a difference. Uh, it's just emphasized how important it is for there to be person to person contact and how important it is for people to listen to people and be aware of what someone else is dealing with in their shoes. But it's also really highlighted again, fortunately in our case, the need that we really have to have different medications to complement the work that people do with talk therapy. They're just not cutting it. They are completely inadequate. All antidepressants, all anti-anxiety drugs. There's just a predictable pattern. So if it's not Vistagen uh, alone, it should be Vistagen and every other company with capacity to deal with this because we need new tools. We've got to redefine what's possible and change the total trajectory of, of mental health care. And and I like, again, the stigma component is gigantic. We've got to get people really to believe, the president's saying it, other people are saying it, physical and mental health parity, it's, it's essential. You know, and just like with what Melissa was saying earlier, Melissa was saying earlier, when we hear that someone has breast cancer or prostate cancer, it's like, okay, here's the plan, let's go deal with it. And you walk through a sequence. The same thing has to be the case with mental health disorders. And it has to be just that, just that normative, right? And I think that's that's what's coming out of the pandemic. I, uh, clearly, we have a problem that's greater than before the pandemic in terms of prevalence. But I also am encouraged that we've got, we've got America's on it. I mean, America is really on it, coast to coast and in every single city. People are mobilizing in all kinds of groups, high schools, elementary schools, Congress, I mean, everywhere. And that's, you know, when we get on something, we're going to nail it and it'll happen. I, I totally agree with you when you talk about the schools are on it, the sports teams are on it, the, the you know, the entertainment industry is on it. Um, we as corporations are actually taking the steps to say our employees, if you need a mental health day, there's no excuse for it. You just take it. You know, so I think we're all looking at it as an important factor as the pandemic that it is. 
it's in itself, mental health is its own pandemic. So I totally agree with you. Kana, I can tell that. <laughs> so please, um, your remarks to this question. Sure. So, I mean, uh, I think COVID affected us in several ways. First, it created more distress. Second, I think it opened up the aperture in the conversation. And third, it accelerated innovation. So in, in creating more distress, we had 50% increase in adolescent girls going to the emergency departments with thoughts of suicide. We had the highest number of overdoses ever, deaths by overdose ever. We had at some points 46% of Americans saying they were experiencing symptoms of depression and anxiety and 30 to 40% of employees saying they're experiencing symptoms of burnout. So a lot of distress, um, which then created greater awareness. So then in turn, 70, 80% of employers saying we're going to take action. 51% of Americans saying this is the most important health issue right now. Actually, most recently, you know, uh, mental health for the first time outstripped COVID um, as the most important health issue. Um, and then investors, right? There's been a doubling of private capital going into behavioral health companies in 2020, 2021, 2022. So it's um, gotten, you know, it's reaching more and different audiences. And then finally, the innovation, right? Telehealth spiked for everybody at the beginning of COVID, um, but then rapidly came down kind of after that first uh, spring um, into the summer. Whereas for behavioral health at one point, about 70%, let's say, of, of psychotherapy visits were um, telehealth in uh, March, April, May, 2020, they are still at 45%. So, and then psychiatry, forget about it. Psychiatry is still even higher than that uh, as tele. So, you know, whereas for other modal, other types of care, um, things uh, went back to kind of normal uh, for behavioral health. It's just the horse is out of the barn. It has shifted forever. Um, and then the adoption of digital tools, you know, the, the meditation tools, the self-help tools, the opening up of more stepped care models, you know, use of BH coaches, all of those things, I think, are really great innovations that came out of this experience. I totally agree with you. Melissa, we have a few more minutes, so I wanted to make sure I got your remarks in. Yeah, thank you so much. So I'm coming again uh, up to the technology. So, so we, I don't want to talk about statistics, and I know that we all can find the statistics on, on, on the internet. So, but I'm also very glad that we use this conversation to talk mostly about the solutions and about the concrete actions than just to talk about the challenges and the problems. So I want to say that, yeah, we have we have increased number of population that is struggling with mental health issues, and unfortunately, we are entering in the total new mental age. So I want to say that if we take the definition of technology as do more with less, we can compensate the lack of the stuff and resources. So we want to use technology, you know, to, to analyze something that human beings cannot do. So to analyze a large sets of data, to process it, and then, you know, to give us to the therapists and to the national healthcare systems this incredibly important information in order for us to make very good and uh, very efficient strategic plan, how we can deal with it. So again, I, I'm coming, you know, I'm, I'm emphasizing this thing about the technology because we want to use technology not to replace us. We want to use technology to help us to do th that human beings cannot do. And this is the purpose of the technology. I totally, yes. I mean, what you've said actually is the use of technology along with maybe treatment plans as well. So I, I totally agree with you. I'd like to thank everyone who has joined us. I think the chat box was off panelists while <laughs> our conversation was happening. So unfortunately, we don't have questions from the audience. Um, I'd like to say maybe to Concordia's team that if there are questions, maybe we can get an email to us. If anybody has any questions individually for Melissa, Khanna, or Sean, or myself, we can answer them, or maybe when the recording comes out, we could put some answers in that as well. But I'd like to thank all of you and remind everyone that we are here. We are here all to do this together. We are a team. We are a country who wants to realize this is a true issue, and we are here to make a difference for all of this. So thank you so much again, Kana, Sean, and Melissa, and thank you, Concordia, for having us on today. 
Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of Concordia, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as Dr. Z said, absolutely, please email us if you have any questions that you would uh, like us to pass along to Vistagen, Dr. Z, or the rest of our esteemed panel. Um, apologies for that oversight today, but we'll be sure to get those questions answered um, as quickly as possible. Um, thank you all. Thank you to our esteemed panel for sharing your expertise today, and most importantly, for the work that you're all doing every day on this important issue. We hope this conversation brings us one step closer to removing the stigma around mental health, and we continue to raise awareness and education on how to self-identify mental health, as well as identify it in others, at home, in relationships, and in the workplace. A follow-up email will be distributed next week with the recording of today's event and the opportunity to connect with today's panel as well as Vistagen to continue this discussion. We really hope the conversation does not stop here today. Thank you all again so much and have a great day. Bye-bye.